This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I right. Right. And I, was so and I just thought, well... I figured it out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Stefan Alexander. The story was recorded in July 2014 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So um, I was born in Trinidad, <clears throat> and I grew up in the Bronx, New York. And, um, you know, one of the good things about that move was the move away from voodoo. And you'll understand that in a second, after you hear the rest of the story. So one of the, my favorite, you know, when I was a kid, um, my favorite hero was Iron Man. And, you know, once I discovered that Tony Stark was a physicist, that was it. I knew I wanted to become a physicist. So fast forward um, 30 years, I finished my PhD, um, and my dream to become a physicist is realized. And I get my first job as a professional physicist, um, at Imperial College in London. So here I am in London, jump out the, the tube station at the Gloucester Road um, station in South Kensington, and life couldn't be more perfect. I walk outside and I see the architecture which, and the smells, which reminds me of Princess Town, which is um, the city that I'm from in Trinidad, which is, um, Trinidad was an English Commonwealth country. So this is perfect, life can't be bad. My, my dream is realized as a physicist, and I'm in a place that's familiar, right? Now remember, I had, at that point, 17 year, years worth of dreadlocks, and keep that in mind. <clears throat> I'm very, you know, I'm a Dartmouth guy now, so you know, I gotta, kind of conservative. <clears throat> so, um, get into the office at Imperial College, and a couple of months go, go along, and this is theoretical physics, and the subject of that time was string theory, and early universe cosmology, and my job, was to unify those two things. This was the year 2000. Only to realize that the other postdocs who were recruited there were from mo most, mo everybody except me were European, and their training was a lot more technical, um, and they had a lot more focus than I did. So, for example, Jussi Kalkinen from Finland, who was a six foot seven guy who had just finished serving as a sergeant in the Finnish army, was one of the other postdocs. And this guy would literally lock himself in, in his office, okay, for 12 hours and calculate straight, taking espresso breaks in between. So, of course, trying to fit in with that whole scene, I would just do the same thing, except two hours would go by and I'd fall asleep in my office and go to the pub and drink. All right, so that was... So when I quickly realized that these guys really had things that I didn't have as an American, trained as an American theoretical physicist, I realized... I'm, uh, I'm really above over my head here. Um, and to, I also thought I was a creative guy. I had, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, th these guys can calculate, but I, I got ideas. So I would come up with an idea to only realize that it was trivial or they had thought about it already. So, you know, it was really the case that I really started to, my dreams started to fade away, and I realized that, you know what, I just go back to my sax. At least, you know, nobody in this group can play the saxophone. I just go back and, you know, work on my horn and live on the streets in New York and do what ordinary jazz musicians do. Um, and this was the reality. I was really fading out of the situation. So I said to my, you know, I'm just going to be really nice to everybody. I'm not going to, you know, ruffle any feathers, be nice to them, yes them to death. And as we say back in the Bronx, just collect the check. All right? Months go by, and I'm doing my, my gimmick. Um, and one day out of the blue, I get this um, email from Graziella, who was our Brazilian um, assistant for the group, for the theory group. Professor Aishin would like to see you. 
Now, for those of us who are theoretical physicists, who are mathematical physicists, would know the name Chris Isham, who is known to be probably the father of quantum gravity. Okay? He is a person, the contemporary of Stephen Hawking. He is the one that the great mathematical physicists go to to make sure that the equations are right. Okay? So I can go on and on about how much of a genius this guy is, but just trust me on this. You can Google him later on. So to get an email from my boss saying that he wants to see me, by the way, people wait in line to try to see him. He wants to see me. I knew what that was for. It was, a, right? it was to fire me. It was the first time in my life that I turned white. <laughs> All right? I'm actually not kidding you. All right? It felt good, too. Actually, it didn't. <laughs> Had to get a tan right away. Um, so anyway, I was like, okay, I got to go. Anyway, a week later, I'm walking to this guy's office, shitting bricks. So I get into his office. And Chris Isham, he was a contemporary of Stephen Hawking. He had actually had a neurological disorder. He's uh, in pain all the time. But I didn't know that. So he's sitting. He's a lanky British guy with black hair, black beady eyes, and he's sitting there. He's a good-looking guy because he might be listening to this one day. I don't want to piss him off. And he's sitting there, his legs up, and the thing is trembling. And I thought he was, like, trying to strangle me or something. So I get in there. I didn't know it was because of his neurological disorder. So I sit there, closes the door, and he goes, why are you here? So, of course, if you ever get pulled over by the cops, right, what do you do? You tell the truth. You don't BS the cops. So I said, listen, I know I suck, but, you know, it was my dream to be a physicist. This is all I have. And he goes, um, they need to throw away those physics books. What you need to do is to excite your subconscious. You see, you see those books over there? And there's this, like, line of books. It's a complete collection of Carl Jung's work. Of course, behind that is blackboards full of equations that very few people in the world know. And he goes, you see, I've also been a, a Jungian psychoanalyst for the last 15 years. And if you really want to be good as a physicist, trust me. I do all my calculations in my dreams. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking, what did I smoke? <laughs> right? So this guy is like, show me this Jungian book. He goes, yeah, so from now on, here's what we're going to do. You're going to come into my office every week, and we're going to do dream analysis. You're going to write down your dreams. You're going to sit down here, and I'm going to tell you, you're going to tell me your dreams. So of course, this is like, okay, this is better than getting fired. But, you know, but at least I'm talking to the man. I'm talking to the, you know, Chris Eichen, right? And I'm actually throwing Chris out of the closet right now. because I'm. You know, <clears throat> but the point is that I went along with it. So weeks when I would come in there, hey, so what did you dream of this week? Girls. <laughs> I had some nightmares about some stuff I'm worrying about. But nothing of real essence having to do with the research, right? So I'm like, this shit is not working. You know, but every week I can collect money. So this is good. So anyway... There was one dream that actually came up that was interesting, and the dream was as follows. I dreamt that there was this old man in a white beard. I know, he looks like God, but anyway, go along with me. And he was wearing a white robe, and he's in outer space, and he's doing this. He's circling, right, in a given direction, like this. He, at first, he was writing a bunch of equations, and of course, I'm like, please, please, show me something. I don't understand the equations. I'm dumb. And the old man, the blackboard disappears, and he's doing this with this spiral movement. And I didn't think much of the dream, but I told Chris this dream. I said, like, so, um, you know, Chris, I'm um, this old man. And he goes, yeah, tell me more of the old man. Was he circling to the right or the left? I'm like, Geez, this guy's crazy. He's like, he really lost it. Tell me more about this guy. You know, like, did he, what did he look like? This went on and on and on and on. And one day, but through that, Chris and I actually got close. We became friends almost. And one day he invited me and the other postdocs, the other, these other monsters, um, to, to, um, to, to have wine with him at his place in Holland Park. So we're at his flat, and we see through the window in this table a stack of paper with beam of light, like basically, you know, hit in the paper, and we see freshly written equations on a stack of about 100 pages for the paper. And we're, we're hungry, we're like, we're desperate for ideas, right? This is our lifeline. We're looking at this, 
Chris is talking about, you know, his love for singing. We're, like, looking at these papers. So he goes to use a bathroom. And when he's gone, we scurry over to look at the paper. We're like, oh, shit, it's Topo's theory. It's some new shit. Oh, my God. Like, I was saying, they, the British guy was saying some of the British stuff. So, like, we're, we're looking at the stuff. And Chris comes in. We jump back. And I say, um, another post I goes, uh, um, Dr. Aisham, um, the stuff you got written there, what, what, what is it? And Chris nonchalantly says, oh, you know, in the middle of the night last night, uh, I had a numinous dream. It's like some Jungian word that I, it takes a long time for me to explain. But I had a numinous dream, and I woke up excitedly, and I jotted down those equations. So it's quite interesting stuff, topos theory. And after that moment, I religiously went to Chris's sessions. I read the Jungian books. Not, I read two of them. I read... Adam and Archetype, which is a book that he, that um, Wolfgang Pauli, who was one of the fathers of quantum mechanics, and Carl Jung, who has a bunch of letters that they wrote over 20 years of 400 dreams that Carl Jung interpreted of Wolfgang Pauli. All right? So there's a book called Adam, I read that book. And my story ends with the following thing. Fast forward another year, I'm at Stanford, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, almost in tears, because it's also, I, I find myself in a, a similar situation where, again, the other postdocs are much brighter than me, and, and the, 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 the name of the game um, at that point was to understand a theory called cosmic inflation, which was invented by one of my mentors, Alan Guth, down at MIT. And in this theory... One of the problems with this had to do with something called the arrow of time, okay? Whether or not, you know, why is it that time is going in one direction and not the other direction or both? Now, it sounds kind of out there, but one morning I woke up, and I, out of actually the haze of the same dream of this old man doing his thing. And I'm walking down um, University Ave, heading towards campus, almost literally in tears, with frustration of that situation, and then all of a sudden, it snapped. And I solved a problem, a mathematical problem, by the way. It was a, right, because of this dream. And it led to a paper that became you know, published in the highest journal that earned me tenure at Dartmouth College. So I want to end my story saying, thank you, Chris, for saving my life. And I still owe you your, your Young and Pauli book. Thank you. That was Stefan Alexander. Stefan is the Ernest Everett Just 1907 Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College. He was born in Trinidad and grew up in the Bronx, New York. He is a theoretical physicist specializing in the interface between cosmology, particle physics, and quantum gravity. He is also a jazz saxophonist and author and will release his new album, Here Comes Now, in August 2014. His upcoming book will explore the secret link between music and cosmology. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. Also, we depend on listeners like you for our support. If you love the podcast, please consider donating at storycollider.org slash donate. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, and Ari Daniel. The podcast is produced by Rose Evelith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, and to Stefan for telling me about that Carl Jung Wolfgang Pauli book. I mean, what? Thanks for listening.